forget every care And you will find him waiting The Prince of Life is there He flows in the river Soars on the summer air His love is all around you the Prince of Life is there. Open up your eyes. Breathe the air. The Prince of Life is everywhere. Good morning. My name is Mike Silver, and the title of this talk is Jeremiah's Opus. And we're going to start with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings you give us every day. And we thank you, Father, that you have sent prophets like Jeremiah to tell us what's to come. And we ask your touch on this talk. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Got my musical instruments here, the violin, the guitar, and uh, Jeremiah's opus. An opus is kind of like a musical masterpiece, or it could be a, a masterpiece in writing. Now, if you remember the movie Mr. Holland's opus, it's about a musician whose dream was to have his musical masterpiece, his opus, his symphony, be performed, but life got in the way. He had to go get a job. And before you knew it, it was time for him to retire. And he still hadn't performed his symphony. After teaching his last class, he was leaving the school and noticed something was going on in the auditorium. He opens the door and is filled with students he had been teaching his whole life. They were set up to play his symphony. His students had become the real music he had written. They became Mr. Holland's opus. That's what Jeremiah chapters 29 and 32, 33 are, especially the last chapter, chapter 33. This chapter is what the whole book points to. Almost all the other chapters are warning that God is going to judge the nations. At first, when you read the book of Jeremiah, you'd think God is into judgment. He's into pouring out his wrath. He isn't. That's why God sent Jeremiah to the people in the first place, to warn Israel and the surrounding nations to turn from their evil ways. God does not enjoy bringing judgment or punishment. It goes against his nature. God says, I take no pleasure at all in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his evil ways and live. That's from Ezekiel 33, verse 11. But when the time of judgment is past, Jeremiah chapters 29 through 33 describe something different. They describe what Israel will look like after God has judged Israel, after God has judged the nations that God has positioned Israel to be a blessing to all the nations. That's from Genesis 18, 18. These five chapters describe what the book of Jeremiah is all about. And from these chapters, the first four, chapters 29 through 32, themselves lead into chapter 33. Chapter 33 is the icing on the cake. It's the snow cap on the mountain. Chapter 33 is Jeremiah's opus. So first we're going to look at these first chapters. We're going to look at from read some verses from chapters 29 and 30. We're going to start with chapter 30, verses 1 to 3, and we're going to interject a verse from chapter 29, verse 10. This is how it reads. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Write all the words which I have spoken to you in a book. For behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and Judah. When 70 years have been completed for your exile to Babylon, 
I will bring you back to the land that I gave to your forefathers, and you shall possess it. So God is saying that after 70 years, he's going to bring his people back from exile. They hadn't gone yet. They're getting ready to. The next chapter, chapter 31, adds another dimension. This is from verses 31 through 33. The whole days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers when I brought them out of Egypt. For this is the covenant which I will make with them. I will put my law within them and write it on their heart. On to the next chapter. This is from chapter 32, verses 6 through 15. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Behold, your nephew is coming to you, saying, Please buy my field. So I bought the field from him, signed and sealed the deed, and called in witnesses. Then I took the deeds and gave them to my scribe in the sight of all who were sitting around. And I said, Take these deeds, put them in an earthenware jar, so that they may last a long time. For this is the word of the Lord. Houses and fields will again be purchased in this land. In other words, he's speaking before Israel had been exiled to Babylon. He's saying, you're going to come back. God specifically had Jeremiah buy a plot of land in front of everybody as a demonstration that although the people are about to be exiled, God will bring them back. And again, they will buy fields and live in the land. Now, here's the interesting part. Everything we just read from chapters 29 through 32 as of today have either been fulfilled or are being fulfilled right now. After 70 years, Israel returned from exile to Babylon as Jeremiah predicted in chapters 29 and 30. Then Jesus came and initiated a new covenant or New Testament and made it possible for God's spirit, God's law to be written in our hearts as Jeremiah predicted in chapter 31. And now, after 2,000 years, millions of God's people have returned from exile again back to Israel, but this time from all over the world. And they are buying houses and lands, just like Jeremiah predicted 2,500 years ago in chapter 32. <coughs> Excuse me. Now we're going to look at chapter 33. Jeremiah's opus, which describes things that have not yet happened, but are getting ready to happen any day, because we are in the time when these things are being fulfilled. I'm reading from Jeremiah 33, verses 6 and 9 and 15. Behold, Jerusalem will be to me a name of joy, praise, and glory before all the nations of the earth, which will hear of all the good that I do for them, and they will be frightened and tremble because of all the good and all the peace that I make for it. <coughs> I will make a righteous branch of David sprout. In other words, Jesus. And he shall execute justice and righteousness on the earth. <coughs> if you haven't noticed, Satan is throwing everything he can at us, including the kitchen sink. Satan knows something's up. His time is short. He's trying to distract us into worrying about what he is doing. Not the good that Jesus is doing, but the good that is coming is greater, is stronger. We need to prepare for the good that is coming. Listen to these verses. This one's from chapter 32, verse 41. I will rejoice over Israel to do them good and will faithfully plant them in this land with all my heart and with all my soul. That is God speaking. Chapter 33, verse 9. Jerusalem will be to me a name of joy, praise, and glory before all the nations of the earth which will hear of all the good that I do for Israel and the nations will tremble because I will make the righteous branch of David come for. Do you get this? Look at the nations today that speak evil of Israel and all that she's doing. The verse says, when the nations hear of all the good that God will do for Israel, the nations will tremble 
Can you imagine how those who have rejected God's people will respond when they see God blessing Israel like he has promised? God has wanted to do this for a long time, a very long time. God's going to bless the socks off of Israel, and the nations will see this and tremble. If God has been faithful to watch over the words of judgment he had Jeremiah speak to the nations, how much more will he be faithful to fulfill his good word, which he has spoken? His good word is coming like a freight train. Jesus is the good word of Jeremiah 33. Jesus is the fulfillment of Jeremiah 33. Jesus is the righteous branch of David. He's coming to rule and to reign. He's coming to take over. Jesus is Jeremiah's opus. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine on us and be gracious to us. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us and give us his peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. He gave you freedom. Jeremiah's Opus. Chapter 33. Find Israel for defending themselves. I wouldn't be doing that. <laughs>